guys ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I worked with a man who had been in seclusion for 30 years. He had been tied up in a straitjacket continuously for almost three years. Okay. This was in the, the 1970s, and the uh, state of Michigan came with a mental health code, and they passed a law that you could no longer do that. You just couldn't keep someone tied up all the time. But every time they let him go, uh, he attacked whoever was there every single time. Um, and they transferred him up to the facility where I happened to be working uh, because we had a small psychiatric unit. And they asked me to consult because I'd worked with people you who know, had problems with violence and had some success in helping him become. So uh, I spent about an hour preparing to, to talk to him just to make sure that I had no tension and was relaxed. And um, in the process of bringing him into the building, he was, he was uh, not very large. He was like probably five foot six or something like that, maybe weighing 120 pounds, kind of a small, wiry guy. And they had the six biggest, strongest staff out of 700 at the facility bring him in. They brought people from other units to bring him from the vehicle to his room. And there was a row of windows in the hallway at this height, and he put out three of them with his feet. So he was just, just uh, um, incredible in my attention. So I, uh, I opened the door, and I stepped in, and approached him like I approached everyone who was you know, having problems with violence in a non-threatening open stance. Okay, so I can't throw a blow from this stance. Okay, and and so it diminishes the fear. Okay, actually the, the state of Michigan told us to us in training to go in like this, which is like, yeah, you want to fight? Okay, so that brings up fear. So I just went in like this, and he was pacing back and forth at the other end of the room, and so I introduced myself and told him why I was there and what, what was going on. And he just ignored me and was continuing to pace back and forth. And I noticed that he had just an incredible amount of tension, in just everywhere, but particularly in his, his forehead. I mean, I'd never seen that much tension. And I was pretty convinced that he must have a, a really horrible headache. So I just kind of picked up on that. So I wonder if you've got a really bad headache. It just really looks like your head is hurting a lot. And, um, you know, I know something about tension. I work with people who have headaches. Uh, sometimes I can help them get rid of headaches. Uh, and I can give it a try. And if you want to sit down, um, I'll try. And he sat down. And that was the first time anyone actually knew he had language because he had never been tested. Obviously, you couldn't test him. They didn't know if he was schizophrenic, if he was mentally impaired. They knew nothing. Okay. Uh, and so he sat down, and I worked on him, and had no effect at all, and he didn't respond. So I sat next to him and, and just talked for a little while, and when I ran out of things to say, I got up and walked out. And there was a whole crowd of people looking through the little window on the door in the room, kind of seeing what was you know, going on. And uh, the nurse who had admitted him um, and knew his, his history said, this never happens. He always attacks. And there was a young staff person. He was 19 years old. Uh, I'd never met him before. He just finished his training, brand new. And he said, that's nothing. And he just opened the door, walked in, sat next to the guy, and he wasn't attacked either. Okay? He put his finger exactly on what worked. Nothing. For 30 years, every time this man had human contact, it was from people who were stuck in fear-based thinking. They approached the whole situation from fear. Their fear triggered his fear, and then he escalated their fear, and they were off to the races. All of a sudden, twice in one day, two guys walk in who are not afraid, and he doesn't attack. It's as simple as that. Fear-based thinking can keep us locked up. And the way it works is that fear-based thinking puts our mind, body, and emotion into crisis mode. Okay? Crisis mode is like being chased by a bear. Okay? You don't think about where you're going, you don't analyze, okay, what species of bear is that, how fast is he, and you don't pay attention to what you're stepping on or in, you just get the hell out of there, okay? And so what happens is our, our body gets all of this energy, okay, to deal with whatever threat there might be, and if acting on that energy is appropriate, it builds up tension, okay? Our mind narrows its focus to the threat. All I'm worried about is the bear. It's all I care about. I want to get away from that bear. You're not taking in information, you're not learning anything new, you're not solving problems, you're not seeing the large picture, you're not asking questions, you're just going. Okay? And our emotions are driving us forward. Okay? And basically, uh, in a crisis situation, the emotions tend initially to go numb, and that's 
a, a survival thing, because if I break down crying, oh my God, a bear, well, then I'm lunch. Okay, so it, there's a tension that blocks that initial experience of emotion. And if I don't resolve that tension, then that emotion just kind of gets stuck there, and that creates its own problems. Okay, so fear based thinking keeps us in crisis mode, crisis mode, and the driving factor of it really is the tension. And it's tension that's physical in our body, that's our muscles. You can feel it. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting. You don't tend to feel it because it numbs us. And so we're not aware of how we tend. So if I walk around like this for the next few months, this will feel normal to me. Okay? But if I pay attention to it, I can let go of it. And what happens is the fear, the tension, the fear brings up the tension. The tension draws our mind to focus on what's wrong. That's simple survival. Okay? I saw a, um, a deer through the window of our house um, a while back, and uh, I just kind of made a little bit of a movement, and the deer just narrowly focused right in on me. Okay? And I made another movement, and then she just really locked in on, on where I was. And my dog came trot alongside of the house and got closer to a deer than he ever had in his life because she was no near, so narrowly focused. So that's what we do. Okay? That's what happens to us. It's like we put on these blinders and we're not taking information, we're not asking questions, we're not seeking understanding, we're just reacting to what's happening. So in, in, our, in, our, in our mind, we jump to what worked before. This isn't the time for creative solutions when I'm being chased by a bear. Okay, it's, that tree worked, I'm going to go to that tree even though you know it's been damaged since it might fall over. I'm not paying attention to that. So we're drawn to what's worked before. We're also drawn to a strong leader who claims to keep us safe. And we don't question whether that leader might have our best interests at heart. Okay, so we, we just simply don't ask questions. Okay, we just push ahead, push ahead, push ahead. And that really diminishes who we are. Okay? So we need to understand how fear works and what we can do about it. Okay, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, there's really three kinds of fear. Okay, there's natural fear, mental fear, and structural fear. And this is really helpful in terms of how you deal with it. Okay, natural fear is a response to a perception of a threat. A direct threat right now, right here. The bear's chasing me, I take off. Okay? That fear actually lasts potentially a fraction of a second. It gets our attention, okay, energizes us, narrows our focus, and we react. Okay? Then once we're safe, it's fine. And you see that. Um, in, in animals in the wild, okay? They'll, they'll run and get away, and as soon as they're far enough away, they're safe, okay? I was in Africa, and, and there was a, a wildebeest killed nearby our camp, and uh, the lions were right there, and the wildebeest were around, grazing, because they knew the threat was passed, okay? The lions had what they wanted, and they were going to go after them, okay? So the problem is, is the reaction to natural fear works in the animal kingdom, okay, but it tends to work against us in human situations. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I remember I was uh, just sitting in a car talking to a friend, um, and uh, the windows were down, and I felt a gun pressing up against the side of my head. I took a slow, deep breath and paid attention to the guy with the gun and tried to figure out what was going on with him. What did he need? What did he want? Well, uh, he says to me, what are you doing with my wife? It's like, I didn't know you were married. <laughs> okay. She gets up and runs out. Um, I just say to him, wow, uh, yeah, I'd be upset too if, if I was married and some guy was sitting in the car talking to my wife. Okay. Even though nothing was happening, I could see how that would be upsetting. So the guy gets in the car and we had a long talk and eventually he gets up and walks away and I'm okay. Okay. If I had reacted out of fear, let the fear dominate my reaction, okay, I would have grabbed for the gun or tried to hit him or tried to open the door, and the chances are pretty high that he would have pulled the trigger at that point. Okay, so not responding to the fear allowed me to assess the situation and survive. Okay, so fear actually works against us, even in a potentially dangerous situation, because as humans, we need to think things through. We need to ask questions. We need to understand what's going on. And that's what we don't do with fear-based thinking, which gets me to the second kind of fear, which is mental fear. Mental fear comes from thinking about threats. There's nothing going on right now that's causing me any problem, but I'm thinking about terrorism or, or catastrophe.
catastrophes or losses or, or going broke or whatever. All of those things have the same effect as fear. As, as fear. Okay, so it increases my energy, narrows my focus, gets me moving in a direction without any, asking any questions. And that lasts as long as I keep thinking about it. Okay, so we could keep that going our entire lifetime. You can think about everything that could go wrong. And every time you think about that, you're creating the fear reaction, which then feeds the fear-based thinking. And we can get stuck there. And I think that's a good thing to think about when we're looking at the problems that we face today. Because most of the solutions that are offered to those problems really come from fear-based thinking. Trust me, we'll keep you safe. Okay? Fear-based thinking looks for power over whatever the problem might be. Okay? So, so this bear is attacking me. I want to be able to take down the bear. Okay? Even though it might make more sense for me to get away from it. Okay? So we try to seek power over when we're afraid. And this power over creates a problem because the people who have power over them, who, who have power over them, then become afraid and try to seek power over. And so we've got this escalating thing that's been going on for centuries where we're continuously at war. And we think, oh, when we're conquered, then we'll be safe. But we're not safe because they've been conquered and now they want to attack us again. And it's all fear-based thinking feeding on itself. Okay? So fear-based thinking, I think, is a very serious problem that we need to address. And, and in a way, it's fed by the third kind of fear, which is structural fear. Um, and that's fear that gets structured in our body from the tension that we hold back, okay, from the impulses that we get all the energy that's generated by fear, creates, you know, something, our muscles are ready to go, but if I'm sitting at home worrying about terrorism, it's just going to build up in tension, okay. And so what we need to do is to also learn how to let go of that tension because that tension draws our mind to what's wrong, and that just keeps us stuck in the, in, in the fear-based thinking. So what can we do about it? Well, I just mentioned one thing that's really important, and that's letting go of tension. Okay? Um, and stress can feed fear-based thinking. I've worked with people uh, who come into counseling or have panic attacks, um, and it's just simply from exhaustion, okay? because they've pushed themselves so far. Okay? Uh, I remember working with a woman who, um, she'd had the same job for 15 years, and everything coming into the plant, this was before computers, and everything going out, had to cross her desk. That was her job, is just to manage all the orders and all the shipments and everything. And there was just way too much work for her to do and she was working 10, 12 hours a day, often seven days a week, and just pushing herself and driving and driving. Finally, um, huge chest pains, they take her to the hospital, diagnosis of this panic attack, and I see her in counseling the next day. So we got her back into balance by, by getting rid of the tension and, and, and learning how to keep it from building up. And three weeks later, she was ready to go back to work. Um, and so I saw her the following week, and she had noticed something while she was on break, okay, which she had never taken a break before, and that was one of the agreements that she would take her breaks at work. She had noticed something that saved her an hour a day. And she'd never seen it. In 15 years of doing the exact same job, she'd never seen this obvious way to organize things that saved her an hour a day. Because fear-based thinking is just driving her forward all the time. That's what happens to us. Okay. So what we can do is we can transform, once we restore balance, we can transform fear into concern. Okay. So I'm afraid of terrorists. Okay, and my reaction is I want power over those terrorists. Let's destroy those terrorists. Let's blow them up. Okay, let's get rid of them. Let's attack them. Well, that's exactly what they say. <laughs> that they want us to do is because they have a martyr kind of a, of a mentality. Okay? So if we back up and look at it as a concern, okay, now we can begin to think about, okay, where did these young people come from? And it's interesting, in Europe they came from the prisons and they came from the neighborhoods where there was no opportunity and nothing for them to do. Okay? And how did they become radicalized and what's happened? And now all of a sudden we have a whole different set of problems here. Okay, it's not us versus them. It's this complicated thing where these people are in a foreign culture where they 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 feel isolated and don't have any opportunities, and they go to crime, and then they get radicalized in prison, and they just feel like they've got a narrow focus, and all of a sudden they can do something they think is wonderful for for themselves and their religion, and you know the illusion feeds itself. It becomes a whole different problem when we transform.
transform a fear into a concern. Now we can back up. Now we can ask questions. Now we can think about it. And instead of just saying to a leader, save me, keep me safe, we can say, wow, does this person really know what they're talking about? Have they thought this through? Do they really care about our interests? We can ask questions that lead to really solving our problems instead of just keeping them going through fear-based thinking. So what would happen if we all did that? What would happen if we let go of fear-based thinking? and just started to see things clearly and to ask questions and to understand. And we would still have pain and problems and difficulty and risks, okay, but we would use our personal resources and we could work together to deal with them. Because it's another thing that fear does is it isolates us, okay? By narrowing our focus, anyone who's not with us is against us and anything that's, that's unknown is outside. And a person who's not known is an outsider and becomes a potential risk. So our brain, in fear-based thinking, creates these categories, okay? And the categories are really broad, the more fear that we have, okay? And so I see someone I don't know, potential risk, and I deal with them. And I look at them for what the problem could be and what the risk could be, okay? So uh, just with to, to back up a little bit, I want to talk about what's going on in our brain when that's happening, okay? Because I, I found it really helpful to think of our brain as a series of roadways. And that's actually a pretty accurate description from my understanding of what's going on because there's, there's a sequence of firing between neurons that, that uh, occurs anytime we have a thought or an image or a memory. Okay? And, and something that's pretty well established, there's a lot that's, that's unknown about the brain, but something that's pretty well established is that these sequences, that you'll go to the same place in your brain when you repeat a sequence. So when someone sees a face that's familiar, it's the same road that they're traveling down. Okay? So if you think about what's happening, all of our experiences are creating these roads. So at any given moment, you're either creating new roads <coughs> or you're reinforcing old roads. And what happens in fear-based thinking is you just keep on reinforcing these old roads and there's no other access point. When we're looking at concerns rather than fear, identifying things as concerns rather than an immediate risk, okay? Now, these roads have lots of side roads, and we can, we can ask questions over here, and look at the history, and look at the implications, and look at the evidence, and the sources, and, and we can see a much clearer picture, and then, and then start to discern what's happening. But in fear-based thinking, we're traveling down the first road. We need to have power over them so they don't hurt us, okay? And so what happens, is instead of roadways, our brain becomes structured almost like railroad tracks because that's all we see. And that defines our reality. It's like being on a train. And all you see is where the train goes. And yeah, there might be some stations, but, but basically that's the direction that we're going in. So when we restore balance, okay, and turn fear into concern, then we open that up. We step off those tracks. We can start creating pathways in our brain that ask questions that lead to understanding and lead to working together. And what would happen if we did that? Okay. I planted a dogwood tree um, on our property back in the early 90s. I did a lot of planting at that time and um, had a back injury and uh, we had a drought and I didn't water it and I just assumed it died. I lost a lot of those plants and I just assumed that's one of them. And I happened to be walking in that area, it's kind of in a back meadow, a number of years later, it was like 17 years later, and I saw it, and it was in kind of a bowl, so I could tell it was something I planted, because I always planted in a bowl so the water would run down. And I knelt down, and it wasn't any bigger than when I first planted it, but it didn't break. It, it was still alive. So I dug it up, and I transplanted it into our garden, which has you know, really good soil, and it has fencing around it to keep out all the predators and all that. And my wife says, why are you planting that chewed up spindly stick? And I said, this is one of those dogwood trees that I planted 17 years ago, and it's still alive. Okay? And that dogwood tree now is over 8 feet tall. Okay? And in the springtime, it's covered with flowers. And in the winter, it's covered with these white berries. And the cardinals love to come and eat the berries. And uh, Christmas before last, uh, there were five pairs of cardinals, 10 cardinals, um, having Christmas dinner on that dogwood tree. Okay? So I asked myself, What's the true nature of a dogwood tree? Okay. 
It became a chewed up spindly stick in response to continuing ongoing threats, okay, of drought and weeds and rabbits and mice and deer, and that's how it adapted to those threats. How have we adapted to the threats that come from our own thinking and fear-based thinking? Could we be the equivalent of a chewed up spindly stick? And what would happen if we transformed fear into concern and started to work together to understand and solve the problem? That was 20 minutes.